Hey everyone, welcome back. So, I've decided to, to not use a title card because it seems kind of redundant, and instead I just wanted to get right into it. So last time we were talking about uh, resonant converters, and we looked at the series resonant converter, I believe, and you know looked at some waveforms and stuff, and we maybe even did a design. Uh, but I wanted to look at another resonant converter because it's a little bit more complicated and a little bit more interesting. And that is the LLC resonant converter. And we, I briefly went over this, right? And LLC just means that for the resonant portion or the, the resonant tank of, of the converter, we're inserting a network that looks like this. It's two inductors and a, and a capacitor, right? So LLC. And even though it looks simple, we just added one extra element to say a series resonant converter. It actually ends up being way more complicated and there's a lot more stuff to, to think about. So let's uh, let's start by drawing the circuit diagram. So this is the LLC resonant converter and I've chosen to use here a full bridge uh, inverter instead of a half bridge. You can use a half bridge especially with the LLC. Actually if you do use a half bridge you can actually use this the resonant cap as a DC blocking capacitor, right? So if you do use a half bridge, then this thing effectively has a DC bias voltage of half the input voltage. And then effectively what's applied, you still get half the gain, but what's applied over here is half VG, the, the amplitude of the AC waveform. And what's, what's uh, kind of beneficial about this network is that for certain cases, this could actually be implemented with a transformer, right? With some maybe some leakage inductance and magnetizing inductance that could take the place of this. However, the ratio of LR to LM is is uh, is a design variable basically, and having tight control over that is important to get an efficient design. Or it it's a it's a choice that you have to make, and it should be precise for you to like understand how to choose other components basically. So while you could use just a transformer and use the leakage inductance, often it's better to have some precisely controlled inductance. And then sometimes also people put this thing down here, this, this cap down here, so it's more symmetric, let's say. But in any case, this is, the, uh, this is what the converter looks like. And really to analyze it, what we should do is uh, is do the the AC model or the DC model, whatever you want to say. Basically remove the switching elements from it and just look at the uh, how these passive elements affect the operation. So let's do that. So here we have VG. This current source has an amplitude of two over pi IR times cosine of phi, right, the phase between the current and voltage. So when they're completely out of phase, effectively there's zero input current draw, right? And then that generates an amplitude of four over pi Vg, right? So this is an AC voltage source. And then again, we have CR, LR, LM, and this is RE. And if you recall, the value of this resistance is equal to n8 over n squared pi squared times r load, right? So this n comes from this transformer, and this 8 over pi squared comes from the rectifier, right? And we could also say that this uh, effective load resistance has an effective voltage of 4 over pi n v out, right? If we're thinking about first harmonic approximation, that's what we're doing here. We're doing the first harmonic approximation. And then over here, uh, we have 2 over pi IP, an amplitude, right? So this is kind of like a, this is, this is a DC current, right? And that's sent to our output. Over here, right? So I've, in, I've introduced a couple of variables, notably IR. So IR is how we've defined it before, right? IR is this current flowing in this loop. I've defined IP. IP is the current going into the equivalent resistance. 
I call it IP because it's effectively here, right? The current flowing here. So it's kind of like the primary current, right? So IP is the primary current. And then we can also define a third current, right? Because there's this branch here for LM. And I'll just define it going down. And we can say that this is the magnetizing current, IM. I've just used capital letters for ease. So with all this drawn and defined, uh, well, first of all, we can just figure out what the transfer function is, right? If we find the transfer function from the input to the output, or from notably this AC voltage source to this equivalent resistance, then we can find the conversion ratio of the converter. And that's kind of like the first step. So let's do that. So again, we basically have a an impedance network here, right? Which relates V out to VG. So just relating this voltage to this voltage, we can say that 4 over pi n or n pi v out over 4 over pi vg. And I'll just use the magnitude here because we're going to be taking the magnitude of this anyway, so I'm being kind of lazy here. And all we have to do is, you know, take this. It's a voltage divider, right? So it's basically this impedance over this impedance plus this impedance. So this impedance is SLM, right? I'll, I'll write that in. This is SLM. This impedance is RE. This is SLR. And this is 1 over SC. So we can basically do this directly, right? So we have the parallel combination of SLM and RE. And that is over, again, the parallel combination of SLM and RE plus this impedance, which is simply SLR plus 1 over SC R. Right? And if we want to simplify, we can simplify this further. Right? So we can cancel out these 4 over pi's and then bring this n over to the other side, which is basically saying that, here, I'll bring it over here, V out over VG, I'll say the amplitude here again because I'm not actually considering phase for this particular thing, just the amplitude gain is equal to n times the amplitude of, well, if we write out this parallel thing, right, it's a product over the sum. Plus SLR plus 1 over SC, right? And we can simplify this further. So if we kind of expand it all out, what we end up getting is something that looks like this, right? So I'm going to bring this down here, multi basically multiply, multiply top and bottom by SLM plus RE, multiply the top and bottom by SCR to cancel that out. And what we get is S squared LM RE CR all over S squared RE Okay. So we've done we've done some stuff, but it's still a little bit obtuse, right? It's still just a weird looking equation. So I'm going to introduce a few more variables. Or I'm going to define some new things, right? And we've kind of already defined these things before when we did the, seri uh, the series resonant converter, right? So I defined Q previously. And in this case, Q is defined as the root of LR over CR, right? So this is like our characteristic impedance, Z0 or really it's the magnitude of the characteristic impedance, let's say that. And this is over RE, right? This is Q, the ratio of the characteristic impedance to the load. I also wanted to find omega naught, or a resonant frequency. And really there are kind of two resonant frequencies here, but the one I'm going to define here, this omega naught is just going to be 1 over root LRCR, right? 
And that's kind of because we see this right here, right? So we kind of have an omega naught over here already. And then I'm also going to define something else, and that is this variable m. So m is going to be something that relates lr to lm. And I'm just going to define it as LM, lr plus lm over lr, right? So it kind of measures how much bigger, let's say, lm is bigger than lr, something like that. Some resources define this a little bit differently. Some of them define it as just, say, lm over lr. It doesn't really matter. You can define it however you want. It just slightly changes the way the equation looks. I'll, I'll put some resources, uh, some application notes, and some other PDFs on the LLC and how they've defined some stuff. But for now, I'll just use this. So using these variables, we can basically simplify this equation. So let's continue doing that. So again, we're looking at the magnitude of V out to Vg. I'm going to leave it to you to verify that what I've done is correct, but right now I'm just going to introduce uh, what this finally looks like, right? And typically to find the, the transfer function or the, the frequency response, we evaluate s at s equals j omega, right? And then we can take the amplitude. So if we do this, I'll, I'll just do both at the same time. What we get is well, s goes to j omega, s squared is minus omega squared. The amplitude of that, or the magnitude of that, is just omega squared. So omega over omega naught, all squared. Lm plus lr turns out to be m minus 1. I'll just leave it as lm over lr just for now. And then for the bottom part, we have a, a real part here and an imaginary part here, right? Because s squared goes to a real number. S goes to an imaginary number. To, ta to find the magnitude of a complex number, we take the square root of the square of the real part and the square of the imaginary part. So we get this is our real part. It's the square of this real part. Sorry. Minus 1 minus omega over omega naught squared. This is m, lm plus lr over lr. Again, I'll do that at one last step all squared plus the square of the imaginary part, right? So we have j omega, the j has a magnitude of one. We end up just having omega over omega naught. We have q, we have lm over lr, and we have one minus, uh, sorry, omega over omega naught all squared. So that this is squared, and this whole term is squared. Right? So these are our two terms. I'm just going to introduce this m. m. I'm going to put m back in here. So what I want to note is that if m equals lm plus lr over lr, then lm over lr is simply m minus 1. Right? And that kind of completes the picture, so to speak. So finally, we have V out over VG, or really, I'll just say it like this, is equal to N times omega over omega naught squared times M minus one, all over the root of one minus omega over omega naught all squared. LM plus LR over LR is equal to M. So this whole term is squared plus omega over omega naught squared, Q squared. So this accounts for our load resistance. And then LM over LR is M minus one squared. And then finally, we have one minus omega over omega naught, which was squared, and then the whole term is squared. And we're done. This is the final equation that we have. So, this is kind of interesting. It gives us some information. So basically, a few things to note and has a direct impact on our game, obviously. M also has a direct impact on our gain, right? So basically, if we increase M, then our gain is going to go up, right? Which means the larger we make LM relative to LR, the higher gain we'll have.
Uh, what else is there? Well, we, we have, it looks like we kind of have two separate kind of resonant frequencies, right? And in a sense, we do. So I'll, I'll say that this is F naught, which is a standard way of referring to a resonant frequency. And then I'll call this one, just for argument's sake, I'll just call it F1. Right? And these two, these represent two separate things. And the way to understand what these represent and how this affects our gain, we really have to draw out two separate plots. So looking back to looking back to our our circuit here, we have this parallel combination of LM and RE. And really the, the key idea here to understand what's going on, to understand these two resonant frequencies, is that depending on RE, this parallel combination can look more like an inductor or more like a resistor. In particular, if LM is very large, so first, well, let, let's just let's just get this down. What do these two resonant frequencies look like? To analyze, what we're going to do is we're going to look at two limiting cases. So the first case, case one, this is going to be, let's say, light load. Or really, when RE is much greater than SLM, right? So this is frequency dependent. So eventually, this is going to be greater than this at some point, but in the region of operation that we're interested in for this fundamental harmonic analysis or first harmonic analysis, we're gonna be considering times when the load resistance is large, or in other words, the load current is small. The other case is the opposite. It's the opposite limiting case, right? Case two is maybe what we'd call heavy load. Right, which is when RE is much smaller than SLM. So what does that look like? Well, let's look at case one first. If RE is much larger than SLM, then the parallel combination, right, the parallel combination of SLM and RE is going to be approximately SLM. What does this motivate? Well, it kind of tells us that our resonant network is going to look something like this, right? And this is gonna be mostly open, right? I'll, I'll, I'll say, it looks like an open circuit over here, right? So we have still one over SCR, we have still SLR and SLM, but that's it, right? We, we're sending very little current to the load, you could say. And we can think about the impedance of this network, right? We can think about the input impedance of this network. And we can do like the same trick we did last time by kind of doing algebra on, on graph to, to figure out the impedance. And yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. But first let's look at the, the second limiting case. So in the second limiting case, it's the opposite. Basically, it's just saying that in this case, SLM in parallel with RE looks more like RE. Parallel combinations of impedances look like the smaller impedance, right? Looks approximately like RE, which means our resonant network is going to look like this, which looks a lot like. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the orange for this. This looks a lot like a series resonant converter, right? This is RE, this is SLR, this is 1 over SCR. 
right? So in the limiting case for heavy load, really the LLC looks like a series resonant converter. But in lighter load situations, it looks different. So let's consider the, the input impedances for both these things. And let's draw them on, on the same graph. So on the one side, over here for light load, we kind of have, here I'll use this color, we, we can draw out the individual uh, components. Here we have a cap. What does a cap look like? Well, at low, low frequency, it looks like an open circuit, and a high frequency looks like a short circuit. A slope of minus 20 dB per decade. We also have this equivalent inductance, right? Which is SLR plus SLM. I'll just draw that somewhere over here, All right? So this is, this is like one over SC. Maybe I'll go back to purple. This is like one over SC, and this is like SLM plus LR, kind of, kind of, right? So that basically, it is a larger inductance, right? And if we consider this, there's like no damping here, really. It's light load. So the overall impedance would look something like this, right? And we would go somewhere off to some really high, some really small impedance, right? Because eventually, when the impedance of 1 over SC equals the impedance of SLR, plus SLM goes to zero, right? So there's some really high Q, right? So we have some impedance that looks like this. And then similarly over here, it's just the only difference really is we've removed SLM and now we have RE. So we have a new resistor or a new inductor, right? Which is at higher frequencies, smaller inductors are shifted to higher frequencies, right? So they cross, this crosses CR later, right? And then it's also limited by, uh, The, the load resistance, right? So it's gonna follow somewhere over here and then be limited by the load resistance, right? So with these two limiting cases, we have these two distinct frequencies. Uh, this one, which I'm calling F1, you don't have to call it F1, I'm just choosing to. And this one over here, which I'm calling F0. And they're two limiting cases. So if you live somewhere in between, it's gonna kind of be a mixture of the two basically, right? That, that's kind of the best way to understand what's going on here. For very light loads, it's gonna look more like this weird thing. And for very heavy loads, it's gonna look more like this thing. And maybe we can do a, a little testing to see what's going on. And I'll, I'll just do kind of a naive test. And it turns out that this gives you a good idea for intuition, but it's not the most precise way to define things. So one, we can figure out the gain at F1. Right. So what I want to do is evaluate this transfer function at F1. So which one is F1? Really, I want to force this thing to zero. So I want to evaluate this at omega equals 2 pi F1, right, which is basically here, right? I want this thing to go to zero. It turns out that the, the uh, omega naught that we want to plug in is actually omega equals omega naught over root m, if you want to use the notation that I've described here, right? And if we do this, this this thing will go to zero. You can, you can kind of see this directly. If we plug in omega naught over root m, omega naught over omega naught is one, one over root m squared is m, times m, or one over root m squared is one over m, times m is one, one minus one is zero. So if we do this, we get n over omega naught over omega naught, right, that cancels out, times one over m, times m n minus one, this first term, one minus one, effectively this goes to zero, 
plus omega naught, I'm plugging this in, right? So we get one over m, q squared, m minus one squared. And then over here, we get one minus one over m squared. Right, and we, and we can continue doing this, right? Let's, let's, let's continue simplifying. Eventually what you get down to is n times m over root m, m plus one times q. And then if you want to replace q back with, you know, the load resistance, because that's kind of what we're typically interested in, what we get is m, and I'm just going to simplify this m over root m thing. We get, <laughs> we get n times root m all over m plus one. And then q is actually equal to, well, one over q is equal to re over root lr over cr. Right, so this is the gain at f1. And it can be a high gain, right? We can choose n to be high, can choose it to be large, and it's also load dependent, right? Re is directly in this. Right, so we have multiple ways of, of adjusting the gain around this frequency, right? As the load varies, well, a bunch of these are fixed, really, but I mean, as far as the design goes, to design your peak gain, you can choose LM to adjust M, and you can choose LR over CR, or like the characteristic impedance of your network, to adjust the gain as well. And you can also choose N, right? So this gain, the, the gain at F1 is load dependent. That's, that's kind of what I want you to notice. As the load increases, or as RE decreases, right? As the amount of current increases, as RE decreases, the gain decreases. So the more current you try to draw, if you operate around this, this resonant frequency, you actually get less gain. And let's, uh, so that's interesting. Let's, let's see what happens at, uh, at F naught. It also turns out that, th that this might not be actually the maximum gain point of the converter, but I'll kind of roughly explain that because I was looking for a cl nice closed form solution for you guys, but it turns out it's a bit more complicated. And a lot of the graphs indicate something specific, which we'll get to, but they never actually give a formula, which makes me think that they just plotted a few different plots and you know connected maximum points on it. We'll see. In any case, uh, let's find the gain at F naught. So we use the same equation, right? We, we, use, we use this equation. At F naught, we're actually forcing this to go to zero, right? So we're making that go to zero if we evaluate omega at omega naught. So what does the gain look like? Well, this goes to one, so we have n times n minus one all over the root. This thing goes to zero, so I'm just going to ignore it. This thing goes to, this term here goes to one. So we're gonna have one minus m all squared, the root. And you can see that it all cancels out. And then what you end up with is simply the transform returns ratio. This is not load dependent. This is load independent, you could say. Right? So when we, we always get the same gain, no matter what the load is at F naught, the gain of this converter is always just equal to the turns ratio. So if you don't, if you don't have a transformer in this converter, the gain is one. Otherwise, it's whatever the turns ratio is. So at heavy load, this is basically, at the, it looks more like a series resonant converter. And as you know, for the series resonant converter, at resonance, you get a gain of one. If we want to plot the Bode plot, if we want to look at the Bode plot of this converter, we can, considering these two things. So just for argument's sake, yeah, I'll, I'll say that this is, you know, h of j omega, the absolute value of h of j omega. For argument's sake, I'm just going to say that, you know, f1 is here. And then maybe f0 is here. I mean, people probably wouldn't design it in this way, but whatever. So at light load, 
it looks more like that C L L or L L L C, right? The network that was just over here, right? This is what it looks like, right? And the impedance looks like this. If you flip it over, you get really high gain at F1, as we noted when we evaluated this transfer function at F1, right? So at light load, the converter looks something like this. All right, super high gain at very light load. And then it comes down and ends up petering out for very high frequency. So at very high frequency, basically all that would be here would be the division, uh, a, an impedance divider of SLR and SLM, right? Because this would basically go to something very small and you just have some division between these two things. So you have some gain, high frequency gain that is somewhere over here and probably also at high, very high frequency, then RE would become more apparent and then you'd probably trail off, right? It would probably go down somewhere at high frequency eventually because eventually the load resistance would have a lower impedance than the uh, inductors. Cool. So this is kind of like our, our light load. Then at heavy load, it basically just looks like a uh, series resonant converter, right? And at series resonant converter, we know how that looks. It basically just looks something like this, right? So we have some Q, which is dependent on the load. And right here, we noted that the gain for the SRC is simply n, or if we want to think about 20, uh, the, the Bode plot, we would just have a gain of say 20 log of n, right? So this is like our heavy load case, right? And as the load varies between these, right, as it goes from light load to heavy load, we, this high peak becomes damped. And basically we end up transitioning from this Bode plot over to this Bode plot. So typically what people draw looks something like you slowly get closer and closer to something like this. And these peaks decrease and the peaks also shift over, right? Well, that, that, that's the thing that I was trying to find for you, but was unable to find, or a nice closed form solution anyways, but you, you can plot it yourself if you, if you want to. So we end up getting these transitionary uh, Bode plots for different loads where the gain varies, right? In, the, in this light load domain, and it's fixed at this F naught. And typically what people do, and I'll, I'll provide links, people will draw the different regions where they'll connect the peaks of these uh, Bode plots or the peaks of the, yeah, the peaks of these Bode plots for different gains. And they'll say that these, this line, this boundary actually touches the point of highest gain uh, for each of these Bode plots for the different resistances. So these peaks are actually shifting more towards F naught. So as the load Uh, goes from light to heavy. Our peak gain shifts from F1 to F0, right? That's kind of what's happening. So at very light load, our peak gain happens directly at F1. And then as it shifts over, as the load increase, or as the amount of current drawn increases, this peak kind of shifts over. In any case, this boundary actually has a secondary important point, right? So if we think back to the impedance plots that we looked at before, over here, and if you recall what we talked about with the SRC, this impedance plot is actually telling us something about whether or not it's going, it tells us something about the soft switching really tells us something about what the input impedance looks like, which tells us something about the phase relationship between the voltage and the current at the input, which tells us something about 
if we have negative current beginning at the beginning or end of the switching cycle, basically. So over here, it looks capacitive. And then way over here, sorry, one over SE, it looks uh, inductive. This typically, if something, if the input impedance looks capacitive, usually that means we have zero current switching. And if it looks inductive, typically it means we have zero voltage switching, right? This intermediate region between F1 and F0, it could be either. And it depends on your load resistance. So this could be zero voltage switching or zero current switching. And this boundary is actually defined basically here. So this region all over here and beneath this plot, right beneath beneath this boundary over here is all ZCS. Over here, it's all zero current switching land. And then over here, I'll use uh, this color over here, above this boundary, it's all zero voltage switching land. And this is this thing, this blue line is our boundary. turns out you can actually define the critical resistance uh, to find if you're able to have zero voltage or zero current switching. So recall, this is always going to be zero current switching. This is always going to be zero voltage switching. But in this intermediate region, right between these two points, there is a critical resistance, which determines if you have zero voltage switching or zero current switching. Typically, you want zero voltage switching. I won't get into the details. I'll just direct you to fundamentals of power electronics to understand this. But in that book, they make some claims about purely uh, imaginary or purely reactive elements in your resident network. And they define our crit as the following. You, you can find it by looking at the root, they actually give a few formulations, but this one is particularly simple. You can find the find it as the root of the output impedance of the network when the input is a short circuit, which I'll define, I'll show like this. The input goes to the input source, in this case our voltage source goes to zero, times the output impedance of our resonant network when the input source goes to infinity. So those are kind of two weird things, but let, let's just draw it out quickly so you understand. So the two cases that, that they're referring to here, this, is a, this isn't including the load because that's what we're comparing the critical resistance to. We're considering the output impedance here, right? And there are two cases. So the first case, is when this, the input is shorted. So that this case is when the input is shorted and we'd find Z out zero. In this particular case, Z out zero is uh, simply SLM in parallel with SLR plus one over SCR. That's Z out with the input shorted. The other case is when it's an open circuit Right, so again, it's looking in this way. Here, maybe, maybe I'll do it like this. So the blue is when the we find the output impedance when the input is shorted, and then the orange is when the output impedance is infinite or an open circuit. Right, and in this case, basically that just removes these two things both one over SCR and SL, and what we end up getting is that Z out infinite is simply SLM, right? And then if you, if you want to find the critical resistance for the LLC, 
it is equal to SLM times the root of S squared LR CR plus one over S squared LR plus LM CR plus one. Right, so it's somehow we're a ratio of the uh, F naught and F one, the root of the ratio of F naught, F naught and F one times times SLM. Right, and that is what you compare your load resistance to. So when you're, I'll I'll, I'll just be specific. Recall, heavier loads looks more like a series resonant converter. So if I, if I haven't screwed this up in my head, then if RE is less than R crit, then we should have zero current switching. RE is greater than R crit, zero voltage switching, right? And this is basically just the first harmonic approximation of this converter. However, this is really only the beginning and actually understanding what the currents do is way more interesting. We have the, this load dependent Bode plot. As R varies, as R increases, we get more towards the series resonant converter. And for light loads, we can have very high gain uh, closer to F1. In any case, this is just the Bode plots. Really, to understand how to design it eventually, we have to look at the currents and see what the currents are doing. Uh, let's start near resonance. Right? So, what do the currents look like? All right. So to do this, let's simplify our circuit. We're going to we're going to draw another circuit. So this time, we're going to consider a square wave voltage source, right? So this is VG. And this is going to be connected directly to our uh, resonant network. So we have CR we have LR, we have LM, and this is going to be connected to RE. But I also, in the back of your mind, I want you to think, consider the fact that really we're connecting this to a voltage source, right? A pulsating voltage source with amplitude V out over N, right? Because as when the currents vary, they're going to bias the diodes in different ways, and that is going to apply a voltage to this side of the of the resonant network. So again, we have CR, LR, LM, RE, and then I also wanted to find the, these currents again. So here we have IR, IP. IP and IM. So just to reiterate, because we're using this current driven rectifier, if IP is greater than zero, then that means that the voltage here, which I guess we can call VP if you want, VP is going to be equal to V out over N. If IP is less than zero, then VP is going to be equal to minus V out over N. And then if IP is equal to zero, then it's going to be some kind of trans transition kind of period. Maybe we could just say that VP equals zero. It's a little bit more complicated than that, it turns out. Um, but in any case, IP is what's defining what this voltage is. Now we can find IP, right? If we do KCL at this node, we know what IP is. IP or more IP is really I'll use uppercase. IP is equal to IR minus IM. So why is this important? Why is it important to define it like this? Well, if you look back here, and the reason I drew your attention to the fact that our output voltage is going to be applied at this node, VP, is because 
we're basically applying a voltage directly to LM, right? So when IP is greater than zero, not only is VP greater than uh, VP equal to V out over N, it also means, here, maybe I'll shift this over. So in this case, when IP is positive, it also means that uh, the voltage applied to ILM is going to be positive. That means that IM is going to be increasing. And similarly, when it's negative, IM will be decreasing, right? When we apply negative voltage, we're going to be decreasing this current through IL IM or through LM. And then here, it's going to be kind of stationary. So IM, let's say, is stationary. Not, it's not equal to zero. It just doesn't change. So with that in mind, we can begin to draw our... our currents. So first, VG, right, or the, the voltage here. It's a square wave. I'm saying it's a square wave. So for half the switching cycle, it's positive VG, and for the other half, it's minus VG. And again, just to reiterate, this is F equals F naught. We're at resonance. At resonance, we're going to be, maybe this is a little uh, hand wavy, but uh, at resonance, we can pretty safely assume, or we're going to assume that uh, the applied voltages V, G, and V out are going to be in phase. In other words, in this first half, IP is going to be positive, and in the second half, it's going to be negative. With that in mind, uh, with that in mind, I'm going to draw ILM. So in the first half, we're going to be applying V out over N. Maybe it'll it'll make sense after I draw the full image. So here we're gonna have it's gonna be increasing with V out over N. And then the second half it's gonna be decreasing. Eventually we'll see that IP is negative and it's gonna be decreasing with a slope of minus V out over N. Right? So this is IM. Back to this definition that we have up here, IP is equal to IR minus IM. We can also redefine this, right, where IR is equal to IM plus IP, right? So maybe this is a better way of thinking about it. So we can, we're constructing IR by finding IM and then putting IP on top of it, or really thinking about it as here we have a voltage source on this side, we have a voltage source on this side, and really we just have this resonant network of CR and LR, right? So basically these two things are resonating. LM is simply ramping up and ramping down with the applied voltage V out. LR and CR are oscillating with sinusoidally, especially right at resonance, right? These are going to be sinusoidal. The voltages and currents in LR and CR are going to be sinusoidal. So in this first bit, again, you can maybe simplify this even further down to something that looks like this. This is simplified even more than this is right so basically what we're just considering now is a situation where we have we have a defined voltage over here this is vg this is v out over n if you apply this you're i mean we're obviously switching back and forth but if you apply this these two elements are going to resonate right sinusoidally it just so happens that there's an extra current that's flowing here as well so there's like ir and then there's another node, so it doesn't look exactly like this. But in any case, IR is going to have a component of IM, but it's also going to have this resonant component on top of it, right? So IR, the current flowing here, we're just going to draw it on top of IM. And it's going to be a sinusoid, right? And it's going to fit perfectly in this half sine wave because we've selected the switching frequency to be the resonant frequency, right? And in the second half, it's going to be the same, but uh, but inverted, right? So we can kind of see IP here, 
How do we see it? Well, it's just the difference between IR and ILM. Right? So it's kind of like this region here. And if we draw it out, we can say that IP looks something like this. Right? And then when it's set when it's sent to the secondary side, we can say that I secondary of T is the rectified and scaled version, and maybe it looks something like this. This is directly at resonance. Alright, I haven't even specified the peaks yet. I'm just drawing the shapes because the shapes are complicated enough. So right at resonance, we, we get this nice half sine wave in the middle, except basically IR has this superimposed triangle wave from the current forced through LM. Just to reiterate, we can say here that IP, which is IR minus ILM, is greater than zero, which means that we have V out over N. This is like the reverse justification of why this is happening. And here, IP is again IR minus ILM, which in this case is negative, which means we have minus V over N, again, which justifies this, this ramp down of the current. So this is just right at resonance. What happens if we go just a bit higher than resonance, a bit higher than F0? Or sorry, F is greater than F naught. What happens? What happens now? Well, it means that we're not fitting full half sine si half sine waves in these in these periods, right? So let's look at that. All right. So to to understand this, it's again going to be a little complicated, and maybe what that means is that we're going to do some maybe some reverse thinking. Let's say. So the way I'm going to divide this is uh, into four sections. I want to start with VG again. All right, so VG is going to look the same, right? We're going to be applying VG here and then minus VG in the second half of the switching cycle. And then we can think about ILM. So relating this back to resonance, if we decrease the switching cycle, right, if we increase the frequency, then say we stop it here, say we change uh, VG right here. Well, there's a difference between IR and ILM, right? There is, there is a difference. And it's positive. That means that for some period, right, of time after this, because ILM and IR can't change instantaneously, there's still going to be a positive V out applied to to LM, right? So it's still gonna it's still gonna be rising. But the input voltage has changed, right? Relating it back to this, there's gonna be a period of time where this flips, or sorry, where this flips, but this doesn't. This goes to minus VG, but this doesn't. Right, so ILM will continue to increase, but we've applied basically a different forcing function to this resonant network, right? Which will force actually this current to decrease faster. Right, until it meets up with ILM. And then when it meets up with ILM, it will actually cross. And when it crosses, well then, then we're gonna force negative V out over N, right? Maybe I'll just draw it in a picture so you understand my reasoning. I'm going to start here. I'm going to start here. So imagine that we're ramping up our current. I'll, I'll just start somewhere here, right? We're ramping up our current because IR is larger than ILM, which means we're applying V out over N. So this is ramping up, ramping up, ramping up, and it doesn't complete a full half cycle. There's this period of time where 
VG changes, right? So we've kind of, we're applying a negative VG. We're applying a different forcing function. So we can say that we have positive VG here. Now we have negative VG, but still positive V out over N. And if you want to think about it, the forcing function or the delta between uh, or the delta across LR and CR. So input, output, I'll say the delta V. So here, maybe I'll use a different color. Delta V across LR, CR. Here we have VG minus V out over N. Here we have a minus VG minus V out over N, right? And then here we expect that V out will flip. So we're going to have, again, still minus VG. Now minus V out over N. And then the delta across LRCR is going to be minus VG plus V out over N, right? The difference of voltages. And then we can kind of extrapolate back here that we have VG. And we expect, if it's going to be symmetric, that we would see minus V out over N. And then again, we would see VG plus V out over N. So thinking about like the slopes of the resonant current, it's going to be highest here, smaller but still large here, highest negative here, and then smaller but still large here. Putting that all together, what's going on? Well, this is still going to continue to rise. And then the slope or the forcing function applied to the resonant network, LRCR, is going to force this voltage to decrease faster, right? And then when they, when they meet up, the diode rectifier bridge, right, flips. And then we, the LR decreases. And then it, right, LR decreases, or LM, sorry, decreases, starts decreasing. And the resonant network does the same thing, except again, we don't do a full half cycle. Right? And instead, we go back to the beginning and we have a different forcing function, which forces the current to have a slightly different shape. And then we start again. So we have this weird four period kind of switching cycle, right? Where the output voltage or the phase of the diode bridge is phase shifted from the input, right? You can kind of see like the, the peak of this triangle is, whereas for the resonant, where it was like kind of lined up perfectly, here it's shifted. And here you can see that we have like negative current at the beginning, right? Which allows us to have zero voltage switching, right? And if you want to think about the output current, which we can, or we can think about IP and then IS as well, like the secondary current. Well, IP of course is just the difference between IR and IM, right? So, over here, it's going to be positive. And then in this region, it's going to decay quickly, right? Because of the different forcing function. And then here, it's going to be negative, And then, right, just to completely cycle on the previous side, it's going to look like this. And then if we think about the secondary current, well, it's just going to be, or the, the current to the output, or maybe I'll say it's I out of T. It's the rectified version of this, right? So it's going to look something like this. And I've exaggerated it here, obviously, right? So maybe this is like actually way above F naught. But the idea is still kind of the same, right? We're going to have these periods where it looks mostly like a regular sinusoid. And then it's cut off, and we have a different forcing function. And the forcing function, I just mean, you know, like from a, uh, differential equations or something, right? The the applied the applied function, the applied voltage to the network that causes it to do stuff. In this case, the input voltage.
right? So we have this this weird thing where we have this phase shifting stuff, and at the in, uh, at the beginning of the switching cycle, we have negative current, which is which allows us to do uh, zero voltage switching. Hey, so this is Tim from the future, and as I was editing this video, uh, putting it together after the first pass, I noticed that there was a a fairly reasonable explanation for something that I left unspecified here, and that was related to the load-dependent behavior of the the no conduction zone, so the periods where the diodes are no longer conducting. And I wanted to give you a more precise explanation for what is actually going on. So we'll just redraw this uh, simplified diagram with these pulsed inputs to give you an idea of what's going on. So again, we have CR, LR, and LM, right? I'm just going to ignore the transformer for now just to make explanation make a bit more sense. I'm going to connect this to our uh, diode bridge. Right, and drawing this out actually kind of explains a lot, right? So we we have our output voltage over here, right? Or it's across this capacitor. Maybe I'll, I'll fill in. Uh, we have CR, LR, LM, and this is like a, a pulse waveform with VG, right? So these, in a situation where the the diode bridge is off, what is that referring to? It's referring to a situation where this this is disconnected, right? We can imagine that this this part is disconnected from the network, and we're just resonating with these three elements. So what does that imply? Well, it implies that we all these things really still have voltages across them, right? We have VCR, and we have a current flowing through here, IR, right? IR and ILM are, are IR and IM are are equal to each other. But we also have uh, VLR and VLM, right? When these are oscillating, when we have sinusoidal currents and voltages in these elements, I mean, the voltages are going to be sinusoidal as well, right? And really what's forcing these diodes to turn on is the difference between VLM and V out, right? When VLM is greater than V out, well, then we're going to have uh, diodes D1. I'll just label them D1, D2, D3, and D4. D1 and D4 are going to be on. And then when VLM is less than V out, okay, and then I'll include over N, right? When it's less than V out over N, it means that D2 and D3 are going to be on, right? So in a sense, even though this is a current-driven rectifier, like the current in typical operation, or really operation above resonant frequency, where there's like constant conduction, or yeah, there's constant conduction through the output, even though that is the case, below resonant frequency, when we're operating in this F1 resonant mode, what determines what diodes are going to be on is the voltage across VLM. And we can be a bit more precise too, actually, right? Because these two voltages are related, related to each other. They're related through uh, their inductances. So we can come up with, with an expression right, for VLM. So we could say VLM of T, or the, the amplitude, really. Here, I'll, I'll do it like this. VL, VLM of T is really equal to, well, if we do KVL around this, it's going to be equal to VG minus VCR of T, right, and that, that accounts for the voltage across both, both of these, but because they're related and they're going to be in phase, we can just say that it's a scale, the voltage across this is a scaled version of, of the voltage across both of them, right? Precisely, it is related to the value of the inductances, right? So it's kind of like a voltage divider, but here it's an inductor divider in terms of the volt voltage. So when this thing is greater than V out, or the reflected version of V out, V out over N, then that is what's going to determine uh, what diodes are on. And we can draw a picture of this as well, right? We can be, we, we can have an idea of what's going on between moments where LM is in the resonant mode or out of the resonant mode. So imagine uh, 
we have a situation where here we're, here we're plotting the volt and we can, we can actually do both so we can we can plot the voltage of vlm and we can also plot i guess i used red before so we can use red here ilm of t right and this is just zooming in on a on a specific area right one specific transition so in cases where ip is positive where the diodes are biased and lr and cr are resonating together and ilm is independent we have v out over n applied to ilm right and that means that ilm is going to be ramping up right we're applying a positive voltage eventually we get to a point where ir equals ilm and the diode bridge shuts down but that doesn't mean the voltage ne necessarily goes to zero instead what happens the voltage across the inductor becomes sinusoidal right and it's somewhere in between v out over n and minus v out over n and if we consider this sinusoidal oscillation then what really happens like it again we can say that this is uh this becomes some kind of sinusoid right and starts doing something starts curving around the voltage looks like a sinusoid right it oscillates and it's somewhere between positive v out over n and minus v out over n and when it finally reaches minus v out over n the state of the circuit changes right so here at this point there was a circuit state change because uh, ILR, I'm going to do capitals IR, became equal to ILM, right? It was kind of like, you could say some kind of like random occurrence, right? The I, ILR was oscillating and eventually it just happened to meet up with ILM. Then we get into this intermediate state, right? This intermediate state where all three of them are oscillating together. The voltage across VLM is changing sinusoidally. It takes some time for it to go from V out over N to minus V out over N, right? And when it does, we get another state change. The state change here happens because the voltage, we could say, across VLM exceeds V out over N, right? And then the opposite pair of diodes turns on. So for instance, here it's a positive voltage we could say that uh, D1 and D4 are conducting. Here, nothing is conducting, but we're still oscillating. And then finally over here, we could say that D2 and D3 are conducting, right? And that forces or that fixes the, the voltage across VLM. The maximum voltage across VLM can be v, is V out over N, right? Both positive or negative. So it stops it here at minus V out over N, and then we apply a negative voltage in the current effectively stops oscillating and the, the circuit returns to an oscillation at F naught, right? And then we continue on. So we have a slope of minus V out over N LM, right? And this is what f causes the transition. Why is this load dependent? Well, it's load dependent because the gain, so well, let's write this out. Gain at fixed frequency is load dependent, right? If the input voltage, right, so if the gain is fixed, if the input voltage is fixed, if VG fixed, then that implies that V out is load dependent. Right? If V out is load dependent, then these thresholds will change, right? Right? If so if these if these thresholds change, let's say they get closer together, right? If the thresholds get closer together, then the voltage is going to be able to traverse the voltage VLM is going to be able to traverse those thresholds faster, right? So if the threshold is smaller, 
or if the gain increases a bunch, or if the, sorry, if the load increases, resistance decreases, then V out for a fixed input voltage at a fixed frequency will decrease. As that, as V out decreases, the difference between this top threshold and this bottom threshold decreases, and then the time it takes to traverse top to bottom also decreases. And that makes this time shorter, right? And vice versa, if it, if it, if the load decreases or R increases, then V out will increase as well, right? The thresholds will separate and then it'll take a longer time to go from one state to the other. And you'll see more distance in this non-conducting state of, of, the, of the rectifier. So I just wanted to include that explanation, a more precise explanation of what's going on and why this is happening. So this, this kind of indicates, uh, allows you to understand why ILM might be different from IR at sometimes, why they might separate. They separate because the voltage across VLM reaches its maximum value, V out over N. And then beyond that, the voltage across LR is able to increase, and the current is also able to increase beyond that. But the voltage and current, or the voltage across VLM is not able to do that. That's why they separate. And that's why we get these weird state changes within the circuit. I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Cool. And we're not even done yet. We're not even close to being done. So let's just continue on. So this was when F was greater than F0. Now let's, just, let's see what happens when F is between F0 and F1. So it's less than F0, but it's bigger than F1. So this is like, again, this is like the LR CR resonance, and this is like the LM plus LR CR resonance. So we're in between the, this thing, and I'll just do it a little bit less than F0 to illustrate. Okay. So again, our input voltage is the same, right? We're still just applying the square wave. It just happens to be at a different period. Recall, I'm drawing this all, all with pretty much the same scale, but really the periods are shrinking, right? So if we allow a little bit more than one full sine wave of F naught, what happens? Well, again, relating this back to here, if we, al if we allow a little bit more, well, there's going to be a period where the currents match up, basically. And when the currents match up, there is no applied voltage. Right? And basically, we're cutting out the load resistance, and we're, we begin to resonate with LM and LR. So let's see what happens. So it's going to start the same. We're going to have, we're going to have uh, ILM. ILM is going to increase, increase, increase. And let's just say that this is this is the length of time for one full, for one half cycle of the current to fit within this uh, square wave, right? So let's just be precise. VG ILM, and then. IR. So one full half cycle fits in here. And then we get we, we reach this point where IR equals to ILM. When that happens, as we said before, IP goes to zero. When IP goes to zero, the diode bridge effectively shuts off, right? Because nothing is driving it. It's a current driven rectifier. If the current goes to zero, we're not driving it anymore. It's effectively shut off. Right? There's some kind of transitionary period where the diode bridge is kind of changing states. In that period, the output voltage is, is cut away from the network. So we no longer have this nice, you know, uh, V out over N slope. Or there's, a, there's also an LM here, but basically the slope is related to V out. That ceases to happen over here. Instead, what happens is we begin to resonate with F1. F1 resonance, right? Which is like one over two pi LR plus LM CR, right? We have we have a different different kind of resonance, and it'll continue uh, changing. Let's just say it it increases, right? 
And this happens for, for some short amount of time, basically. Right, so we can say that maybe d1, d4 conduct, and then here nothing conducts. Diode bridge is off. And then we switch the input voltage, right? And when, when we do that, we kind of force the, uh, the current to change. So maybe the current is slightly changing here, but it's not enough to fully drive the bridge. Eventually, we are able to drive the bridge. We are able to separate these two currents. IR begins to decrease, right? More than ILM, which forces IP to be negative, which forces a negative V out, right? So we kind of get the same thing over here. Right, and then IR does its full half cycle, and again we meet up with with ILM, and then again we get this with this resonance. This is like, again, the F1 resonance over here. So maybe here D2 and D3 are conducting, and then here it's like nothing conducts, and IR and ILM match up. Right, and if we want to look at the output current or the the primary the IP, we can do that as well, right? So IP. Maybe I'll uh, make it a bit longer. So again, we still have these like these like four periods within within the switching cycle, except it's the cause is a little bit different, and they occur at the end. But what we see, right, so for these periods, these intermediate periods here, IP is zero. So what we end up seeing is something that looks like this, right? And it doesn't look like a, a sine wave that started at zero. It looks like some weird, oddly shaped sine wave, right? So at the beginning, it's kind of like the slope is a little bit different, and then it comes crashing down to zero. And then there's this period of zero current, and then it does the same thing, but negative. And then there's this period of zero current. And if we want to think about the uh, iota of t, it's just a rectified version, right? The scaled and rectified version of this. So this kind of looks like DCM, right? We're kind of sending current in pulses with these gaps, with the with these yeah, small gaps whose frequency of oscillation over here is related to F1, right? So pretty crazy. And I still haven't even specified amplitude, just drawing these things is crazy enough. And then maybe, so yeah, note, we still start with, with negative current, which means we still get ZVS. So we see we get ZVS here. It is, it is load dependent in this region, right? So I'm just assuming that we're at a place where it is still with ZVS possible. This is for sure ZVS because we're above F0, it's always going to be ZVS. And then this is also resonance is basically also ZVS. Finally, well, we, we can go further. Right? So let's say what happens when uh, F is equal to F1. What happens here? Well, this is quite confusing. And to understand it, I really ended up did, doing a bunch of simulations to see what was going on looked at a bunch of documents to see what was going on and I'll do my best to explain what's going on to you guys. So if you recall, again, we can't really think, we can't really, sorry, I should say this is F1. We can't really refer to, we can't really compare it back to conventional resonance because we're kind of beyond that point of operation. But I do want to highlight is the fact that at resonance we kind of have this perfect triangle lined up with our square. And as we went higher, the triangle actually shifted over, right? As we went above resonance, uh, this triangle started to lag, basically. It started to lag the current, or the voltage. It started to lag the voltage. And then here, we're going to see that it's kind of leading the voltage. The peak of this triangle is kind of leading this, the voltage in this way. In, in an analogous kind of sense, right? So what I found were there kind of three regions in here. So again, we can still start with VG. 
VG is still the same. It's positive VG for half the switching cycle and negative VG for half the switching cycle. In this first portion, we are still applying V out over N. Or in other words, really, in this portion of the switching cycle, ILM, the peak, the peak is here, basically. I'm just going to assume that the peak is here. ILM is less than IR, or IR is greater than ILM. And at this point, they become equal. Right At the end of this point, they become equal. So IR is positive for this portion of time. ILM is positive, but IR is greater than ILM, which means IP is positive, and we have V out over N. There's this positive ramp. Eventually, when they meet for a portion of time, which is load dependent, they actually resonate together. Right, and this kind of makes sense with what we saw with, with the Bode plots, right? Or what I showed you with the Bode plots, really, right? The, the load dependence is, or the, the peak, the, the Q, the gain is load dependent. And we, we kind of see that reflected here, right? There's this load dependent region, which as the load increases, this region uh, decreases. So for a portion of time, ILM and IR match. At some point in time, right, so you could say that there's zero voltage applied to ILM, or not zero voltage, it's just related to, to VG and not to V out. We don't have this constant V out applied to it. Eventually, IR begins to deviate from ILM. Right, so eventually it goes positive, and then we get this decreasing slope. So this is like minus V over N over LM. This is a resonant period. Right, of F1, let's say. And then over here, the current begins to deviate, right? And it stays positive, right? And then it's reflected in the second half, or it's there, there's a mirror image in the second half. We see the same thing, except inverted, right? So we, we continue to be above zero, because over here we're above zero, except the slope is going to change a little bit, because the forcing function has changed a little bit, right? We've changed from positive VG to minus VG. So there's a discontinuity here, actually. Or not a discontinuity, there's a cusp, right? So it's varying nicely, and then suddenly we change the, the current state, and then there's this cusp here, and then it eventually meet, meets back up with ILM. Then we get, again, this resonant period, this load-dependent resonant period where they match up. And then finally, IR begins to deviate again, and the whole cycle continues. So again, this is like a resonant period. Here we have minus V out over N. This is still minus V out over N, and this is V out over N here they deviate and again we get that cusp thing here happening so there's a cusp at this point and we'll see that when we draw IP right so this is like really really weird to explain and even or it's weird to draw and even weirder to explain so what does the current look like or IP IP let's, let's do it in blue as I've been doing So what we end up seeing, if we look at the difference, IP. So in this first region, it's positive. And we get some, some current that looks like this, right? The difference between these two things looks like some portion of a sine wave with you know F naught resonance. Really, it's LR and CR resonating together, separate from LM. And in this period, because they're equal in the LM and LR are resonating together with CR, we actually get zero current, right? So again, this, this discontinuous kind of conduction mode to the secondary side. Then we get some negative current. And again, this is still LR and CR resonating together independent of LM, right? LM is doing its own thing because V out is being forced onto it. But you do get this 
weird portion of a sign, right? And then you get this discontinuity again, right, on this side, and you get some weird shape. And again, when they match up, now we're resonating LM and LR together with CR, zero current. And then finally, it does the same thing, and you get these cusps. Right, and then if you want to think about the output current, or the, the rectified output current, again, it's scaled, I'm just drawing a picture, it's going to look something like this. And again, these are basically different portions of an F0 switching cycle. So the, the shape is different, but the overall resonance is related to the same thing. They, and yes, these cusps exist. So really, at this point, we're super far from first harmonic approximation, right? Clearly, this is not a first harmonic. There's a cusp here, right? How can a sinusoid have this cusp? How can there only be one? fundamental harmonic analysis if this is going on. So this is like beyond, this is beyond first harmonic anal analysis and why first harmonic analysis doesn't really work for all things. Really you have to look at what's going on as the circuit changes. And again, or well not again, this is different. This is inherently different operation, right? In every other case before this, we had negative current at the, be at the beginning of the switching cycle. Here, or at the be beginning of the half cycle. Here we have negative current at the end of the half cycle. This, is, this enables zero current switching. You can go lower. You can continue to go lower. And weirder stuff happens still. Let's, let's see what happens. So let's say F is less than F1. What happens here? Well, this is even crazier. And again, basically, I used simulation to understand what was going on here. But uh, I'm just going to draw it out for you. I highly suggest that you simulate it yourself because it is quite interesting and not too difficult. But I'll just draw and explain to you what is going on. So again, VG is the same, positive VG to negative VG. And just for convenience, I'm going to start this at zero. Basically, depending on the load condition, a lot of things could happen, but ILM, I'm just going to start at zero. So in this first par part, we're going to be resonating as normal, right? So LM or IR is going to be greater than LM. IP is going to be positive and we're going to be applying V out over N, right? So this is V out over N over LM. IR in this case is going to resonate. It's going to do a full switching cycle or a full half cycle, right? Great. Full half cycle here. Eventually at this point it meets up with ILM. The diode bridge turns off. They resonate together for some period of time, right? This is a load dependent period of time where they're just resonating together, they're doing their thing. Eventually IR deviates, right? And it, de it actually starts decreasing. If IR is less than ILM, then we apply negative V out over N. So this is like a zero region, a load dependent zero region. Right, and then over here, we're, we start decreasing. Right, because, I mean, if we're decreasing, it means that IR is greater, and we get a full switching cycle here. We, we get a full half cycle, and they meet up again. Eventually, they meet up again. We're so much slower than F0 that they, you get a full switching cycle and half a switching cycle. For example, right, this is just an example. They meet up again, and then they start resonating again, resonating again together, and eventually, this brings the current back up let's say to zero, just to mirror this, this side. And then we do the opposite, right? Then it's just the opposite thing. We apply negative voltage. There's a period where there's no conduction. Then we get the positive voltage. 
and then there's a period of no conduction, right? So th this is this is a period of no conduction, also load dependent. Then we change the forcing function. IR gets a full half cycle. We meet up with ILM. They do their thing together. IR decides, I'm going to deviate from you, ILM, and force the diodes to turn on. Then we get this extra half cycle pulse in here. They meet up again, and then they resonate back down to start the cycle all over again. Right, and that's pretty much what it looks like. Right, so what does IP look like? The thing that we're going to be sending to the secondary side. Well, as you expect, it is basically a continuation of what's up here, right? Except there's a few more full cycles. And you could continue doing this. You could go even slower if you wanted to, right? You could switch even slower and, and have more full cycles again. So over here, it's positive. We get this half switching cycle. We get a period where they don't don't conduct, right? And this actually it turns out that this this pulse is smaller than the second pulse. So this looks like just a conventional half cycle. And here, basically because the forcing function isn't what you expect, right? In this period we have positive VEG and positive V out. In this period, we have positive VG and negative V out, which means that the applied voltage is actually larger, which means that this peak ends up being larger because the applied voltage times the characteristic impedance is effectively the peak amplitude of IR. Because the forcing function is larger, the difference, the delta VG minus negative V out over N is larger, this peak is larger. That's what forces this peak to be larger. They meet up again and then it's just the negative version, right? So here, because the forcing function is smaller, the peak is smaller, IR meets up with ILM, and then eventually they, they deviate, and then you get the larger amplitude due to the larger forcing function, and then it goes back to zero, right? So you get this weird shape, and you could have as many of these pulses within this cycle as you want. You could switch as low as you wanted, and you would get this kind of effect. This peak would still be limited by the forcing function. And if you think about I out of T, or the, the rectified current, it's basically just a scaled version of this, right, except it's all positive. So you get something like this. And you do see these two different current peaks. And again, that is because of the forcing function. If you if you think back, just, just to re reiterate why this is happening. Just considering uh, LR and CR. So in one case, we have this, Vg and V out over N. And in another case, we have this. Right, Vg and V out over N. And if you want to simplify this, this turns into, you could think about this as, if you slide this all over here, it's like applying a voltage source that's VG minus V out over N to this thing. And this thing is like applying a voltage source which is VG plus V out over N to this network. Oh, sorry, there's nothing here. <laughs> to use to drawing stuff at the output, there's nothing here. And the reason this results in different amplitudes is because if you consider the characteristic impedance of this thing, it's equal to root LR over CR, right? And if you're, I mean, you can naively, I mean, not naively, but correctly, you can figure out that if you apply a voltage to an impedance, you get a current, right? So uh, I, R, is somehow related to V applied, in this case, Vg minus V out over N, time uh, divided by the characteristic impedance, right? So here we have Vg minus V out over N, and here we have Vg plus V out over N. Clearly this is larger than this, which means that this peak, I'll call it IR prime, is larger than this peak. That's why that happens. That, that's why this, these different peaks are happening. Here we have VG minus V8 over N. Here you have VG plus V8 over N. And
really, I think that's all I can cover in this video, and hopefully it makes sense because, yeah, get, getting through these different waveforms is, is pretty complicated, and maybe I, I need to figure out how to do, I'll figure out how to do maybe some, like, simulation stuff so that you can see what's going on and we can tweak it instead of just drawing pictures because I think that would be more informative. Before that happens, I highly suggest that uh, you do it yourselves to understand what's going on. Cool. Well, uh, thanks, and I'll see you guys later.